Super Mario, the Nintendo equivalent of what Mickey Mouse is to Disney or David Hasselhoff to the German music industry. The mustachioed plumber is certainly the most iconic character in all of video game history. Recently on this channel, we touched on Mario 64 and how that game revolutionized the world of 3D gaming. So expectedly, fans would pine for a sequel. While ultimately a new 3D Mario game would materialize that generation, this did not stop Shigeru Miyamoto from talking about his intended sequel at the time. Now, we have already covered this conceptual four-player game that Miyamoto used to refer to as Mario 64 2, which evidence points towards likely morphing into Mario 64 DS years later. But in today's video, we are going to be covering the background of the mysterious working title that Nintendo would repeatedly throw around for several years during this period. I am Lady Decade and this is the story of Super Mario 128. The words Super Mario 128 were first uttered by a Nintendo employee way back in 1997, the days when Super Mario 64 was still a fresh new game. Even though the game was still new on the market, Miyamoto, as mentioned, had already begun talking up the sequel and mentioning it at various trade events such as E3 of that year. In these early stages, he would consistently emphasize that the sequel would appear exclusively on the Nintendo 64 disk drive, would allow two-player functionality featuring both Mario and Luigi, and would let gamers ride Yoshi in a 3D environment. Environment. While he would mostly refer to this game in the works as Super Mario 64 2, he would sometimes refer to it as Super Mario 128. Looking at this situation and how casual many of these interviews were, we can identify that the name Mario 128 was actually used in quite a jokey context. After all, loads of games had 64 on the end of their titles for the system, as it helped Nintendo promote their platform's bit count. So just doubling that number for the next entry in the series on the console wouldn't have really made any sense beyond being a funny name. As amusing as a name Mario 128 was, it probably wasn't right for the system. But while the name Mario 128 may have been a joke in the 90s, things would not stay that way forever. At a Nintendo press conference in May of 1999, Project Dolphin would be announced, a console that would function as the successor to the Nintendo 64. This upcoming system was to feature hardware designed by a company called ArtX, with ArtX being acquired shortly after by another company known as ATI. Early in the year 2000, an ATI spokesperson said, ATI has now become a major supplier to the game console market via Nintendo. The Dolphin platform is reputed to be king of the hill in terms of graphics and video performance with 128-bit architecture. While it requires some playing with semantics and a degree of verbal gymnastics to claim that this platform actually has a 128-bit architecture, there is no denying that the system would not pan out to be much more powerful than the Nintendo 64 that came before it. This device was announced as the Nintendo GameCube at Space World on the 25th of August in the year 2000. At this event, a software demo would be shown off that would be controlled by Nintendo staff. This short tech demo was directed by Yoshiaki Koizumi, a man who had previously worked as the assistant director for Super Mario 64, and those in attendance would be stunned when the words Mario 128 would flash up on the screen. It was real. Damn real. The game would start off featuring a huge 2D Mario, which upon further inspection is made up of 128 boxes. A 3D Mario appears from underneath one of them and proceeds to pick up and throw boxes, revealing more Marios underneath each one. 
While all of this takes place, a number counter on the screen rolls up until all 128 Marios are revealed. Throughout this presentation, the terrain in the demo is manipulated, rotated and spun like a floppy saucer, even turning into a pizza at one point. All of this movement was in to show the physics engine in action, but the overall purpose of this demonstration was to emphasise the sheer processing power of the GameCube, illustrating the ridiculous amount of moving polygonal characters who could all appear on screen at once. The demo would send journalists into a frenzy, with GameCube quickly declaring that Super Mario 128 was one of the most anticipated games for 2001. The publication would also speculate that the reason Nintendo did not reveal more was likely precautionary, as directly after Mario 64 was first shown off previously, the exact camera mechanisms would be utilised by competing developers. Moving to the following space world that would take place in 2001, Super Mario Sunshine would be revealed, with Yoshiaki Koizumi taking the directorial role, the same man behind Super Mario 128. The game's development had begun after the demo had been shown off the previous year, with Koizumi now having great momentum hot off the hills of the demonstration and the success of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. So was Mario Sunshine the game the demo would actually result in? Well, no. In December of 2002, new information would surface in Japan's weekly Playboy magazine via an interview with Shigeru Miyamoto, stating that a game known as Mario 128 was in development. He would go so far as to claim that I believe that with this game, you'll be able to feel the newness that was missing from Mario Sunshine. Going on to declare that the game would be closer to a revisitation of Mario 64 than that of Sunshine. Super Mario 128 didn't show up at E3 in 2003, which would lead to speculation that Nintendo was still fearful of having their new ideas stolen, but later that year Miyamoto would reconfirm that the game was still in development. Yoshiaki Koizumi, the 128 demo maker, would join Nintendo's EAD Tokyo office in 2003. Years later, in a sit-down interview for Nintendo.com, Koizumi would reflect back on the day that the original demo aired at Space World, stating that after the event he would continue to think of ways of somehow turning the system that appeared in Mario 128 into a commercially viable viable product, but at the same time wondered whether this would be impossible with the ideas that he currently had in mind. The reason as to why he felt his idea may be impossible was down to technical reasons, as the platform in the demo is built in the shape of a flying saucer, how Koizumi wanted to create a game involving Mario traversing spherical shapes, a concept that Miyamoto had introduced him to five years earlier. After working on Donkey Kong Jungle Beat, Koizumi would begin working on plans for his next game at the EAD Tokyo office, but Miyamoto would challenge him to make something bigger. Koizumi concluded that he had gotten to know staff members very well during Jungle Beat, and decided that by utilising a team he knew well, that he felt ready to take on new challenges and make his spherical platformer a reality. But was this Super Mario 128? It was too early to tell, but as E3 2004 rolled around, the game certainly didn't show up. But in yet another interview, Miyamoto would be back to reconfirm the existence of the upcoming game. The lack of the game this year would be speculated by journalists that Nintendo didn't want to take the spotlight off of the Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess reveal. A Miyamoto interview excerpt about Mario 128 at E3 reads, It's moving along secretly like a submarine under the water. 
When developing, we often look at the different hardware and run different experiments on it and try out different ideas. There have been a number of different experiment ideas that we have been running on the GameCube. There are some that we have run on DS and there are other ideas too. At this point, I just don't know if we will see that game on one system or another. It is still hard for me to make that decision. I am the only director on that game right now. I have the programmers making different experiments and when I see the results, we will make the final decision. Jumping another year through time to the GDC 2005, Reggie fisa -May would predict that Mario 128 would indeed be shown at E3 2005, but likely as a non-interactive video. But as history now tells us, the game was absent in any form yet again. Shortly after the event though, Miyamoto would confirm that the game is still in development, but will no longer be appearing on the GameCube. Later that same year, prototypes of Nintendo's next generation console would begin to be shown, codenamed at that point as The Revolution. A device we now know as the Wii, with the system's unconventional motion controls being revealed to the world. The future was here. With Nintendo's direction being more clear, Shifty Shigeru would continue to trickle out Mario information, this time in a Japanese radio interview, stating that in the upcoming game for the revolution, Mario would have a new character by his side, and reiterated that the game would not be going by the name of Super Mario 128. All would finally become clear with the unveiling of Super Mario Galaxy, a game conceptually designed by Miyamoto and directed by Koizumi. The critical and commercial success broke new grounds for the Mario series, seeing the iconic former carpenter travel from galaxy to galaxy collecting power stars. The desire to create a spherical platforming game had morphed into featuring a range of explorable traversable planets, offering up a truly groundbreaking experience and resulting in a high quality 3D Mario game that many fans had been waiting for since Super Mario 64. During a keynote speech at GDC 2007, the same year that Mario Galaxy was set to come out, he would mention Super Mario 128 once more, a buzz term that had been in circulation for a decade. Here he would reiterate that Mario 128 was a demonstration designed to show off the power of the GameCube. But would clarify that while some ideas for the game had resulted in influence being drawn for Super Mario Galaxy, the reality was that gamers had already played what Super Mario 128 had truly become. They just didn't know it. He would state that Super Mario 128 is a game called Pikmin which features the same foundational gameplay and concept that saw release in 2001. What a top quality troll. Good old shifty Shigeru. You see, at their core, Pikmin and the 128 demo are one and the same. Both games' key technology is in the animation and agency of a multitude of interacting characters. The title that features Captain Olimar at the helm sees him trying to repair his rocket so that he can escape an alien world. To do this, he controls a huge number of Pikmin simultaneously, who can work together to pick up a number of broken parts to return to the ship. Looking at Pikmin and 128, there is no denying at all how similar the games are. As for the Super Mario 128 game's legacy, it is said physics from the demo would be utilised in Metroid Prime. And to commemorate the demo's existence, the game Super Smash Bros. Melee would reference it. The GameCube's 
greatest selling title. Here, an event stage can be found literally named Super Mario 128, which sees players having to take down 128 tiny Marios. But if this demo resulted in the Super Mario Galaxy games, the Pikmin games, and assisted with the creation of Metroid Prime games, then there is no denying that the game's legacy is significant beyond just initially showing off the power of the GameCube. This moment's place in history has been sealed. So I am Lady Decade and that was the story of Super Mario 128, the tale with an amazing plot twist. So if you enjoyed that video, you might enjoy a video that I did recently on Super Mario 64 2. And if you like my channel in general, then please subscribe and like every single video of mine that you come across. And as you know, at the end of my videos, I am now answering questions from my patrons. So today's question is from Ben Harradine, who asks, who would you say is your favourite female fighting game character? For me, that would actually be Michelle from Tekken 2. Um, I pick her purely on the basis of nostalgia. Like when my sister and I were young and um, we used to play Tekken 2 on easy mode uh, without any memory cards or any um, second controller, we always used to pick Michelle and at the time it was literally because we really liked the film Pocahontas and Michelle was supposed to be um, a Native American so that was literally it but both of us used to pick her every single time until I realised that by finishing the game using different characters you unlocked different endings and secret characters and then we started playing with other characters. So that's it for this video and I shall see you all in the next video. Thank you very much.